Have you ever wondered what the live sound industry was like back in the 1920s through like the 1960s? Well, today we're going to sit down with the current owner of Paul Sound, Dewar Timothy, to discuss the late great Harry Paul, who was a pioneer back in those times. Harry Nicholson Paul, he was the founder. Um, he was one of those guys that just had an interest in, in um, audiovisual type things from a very early age. Uh, when he was in high school, he started experimenting with building electronics, uh, you know, building amplifiers and so on and so forth, and uh, uh, record players, what now, whatever had you. He was just very interested in that sort of thing. And his dad was an architect, and so he was somewhat had some resources in order to buy the parts to do it. He um, began by <coughs> uh, uh, building all of his electronics and then uh, actually building his loudspeakers as well. Um, back in those days, loudspeakers were um, pretty hard to come by. Uh, and um, in order to get one that would cover a large crowd, you had to take and modify something else. And of course, the loudspeaker was invented in the uh, Alexander Graham Bell days when, when they had needed something to put in the telephone receiver you know, to hold up to your ear, you know, to make sure that you could hear it. And so, early loudspeakers just took those exact same uh, speakers and put them onto horns, and and uh, you know, in order to cover larger crowds. Uh, and so. His, his access to really good stuff back in those days was very, um, very limited, and he had to build a lot of that stuff on his own. So I don't know exactly, you know, what the speakers looked like. I, uh, in the times that I worked for him, I interviewed him because I was interested in what he was doing, and uh, that's what he told me, but he didn't give me any particulars about um, uh, how he made the loudspeakers. But the uh, amplifiers, that was, you know, technology that had been, had come along. Um, and uh, uh, he had schematics that he could go by, and so he built those. And uh, I understand that he built his early microphones too, because uh, companies like Shure uh, were not even uh, around yet. You know, so there were no micro microphone companies. Uh, later on, he started using Western Electric microphones, and then uh, as Shure and Electro Voice came along, he started using some of them too. Here, I think we have a picture of uh, one of the first sound, complete sound systems that Harry built. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about them? And yeah, so um, in 1924 was when he first had his first job, and so that's why we always refer back to the company as starting in 1924. <clears throat> and it was just a smattering of equipment that he, he put together. And uh, my understanding is that his first job was actually to broadcast the World Series game in 1924 out to people who were sitting on the lawn and uh, uh, using homemade stuff that he had. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures. None of the Paul family never had any pictures of um, of those early that earliest system. These here are from 1928, and this is the earliest pictures that I could find of of the equipment that he had. And uh, you see the sign sitting in front of one one of them. Um, the first name of his company was Paul Audio Broadcasting. And uh, you see that sign says Paul Audio Broadcasting, and then he's uh, advertising his system to take out to parties and events to use. And um, so, and on the other picture on the right, you can see his amplifiers um, uh, with the output tubes in them. Those amplifiers were probably seven or eight watts. They may have been as oh, wow. high as 10 watts, but that's all that they could get back in those days. Wow. <clears throat> He really relied on the efficiency of a horn to yeah, you had to rely to on the efficiency. That out. Yeah. So, so in this uh, picture here, tell tell us maybe a little bit about these bigger horns here. Was that something he would have made, or would have that been manufactured? <clears throat> well, um, 
most horns nowadays use what they call compression drivers, which is a way of getting higher efficiency out of a horn, but that compression driver didn't um, come along until the early 30s. And so in, the, in these pictures back in the late 20s, they had to do something else. So what those are would be <clears throat> wooden horns that he made and, and there's a normal speaker sitting at the back and <clears throat> the amplification a lot because the speaker wasn't playing very loud, the amplification would have been because of the horn. You can see his record player sitting there. And is, that, you, is that the one here on the right? Is that the record player or is this uh, in the front here? It, it would be the one, yeah, it would be that one sitting on the ground. Oh. The one on the right I think was his mixer, you know. Oh, okay, and then uh, what was this big guy here? Was this an amplifier? That, that's the same as that. No, that's a mic. That's the mixer. That's the mixer, <clears throat> and then this on the right is maybe a box with yeah, tools or something in it. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what that is. You can obviously tell the microphone there, but uh, yeah, and then uh, these look like just some speakers as well down here, maybe. Right, right. That's what they would have been, maybe for near field or whatever. And loudspeakers in that time, um, I've pulled some old, older speakers apart. I don't know if they're from this era, but were they a voice coil with a magnet or was it electromagnet with a voice coil or was it like a servo? What, how, how, were the loud, how did a paper loudspeaker work back then? Yeah, um, early ones, <clears throat> magnet material was kind of hard to come by um, back then. And so early loudspeakers, they did wind a lot of electromagnets uh, that were powered by DC. And so the, um, the magnet was just a, a coil of wire uh, wrapped around an iron core and uh, would, would give a constant uh, magnetism for the voice coil to work against. Um, and, and so on, on these particular ones, I don't know because there was, um, there was a mixture of permanent magnet and electromagnet speakers, but I would rather imagine these were electromagnet. Um, so your speaker would have two wires feeding a DC voltage and then another two wires feeding the, the, right. from the amplifier. Yeah, and the amplifiers back in those days provided the DC voltage. Um, uh, it was part of their, uh, part of the circuitry. And so instead of hooking a speaker up that just had two terminals for the speaker, they actually had four, one for the, one for the magnet of the speaker and the other for the speaker. Huh. Interesting. When I started working for the company in the mid seventies, we were <clears throat> in, in his archives, he had um, several of these uh, electromagnet speakers. And I, I was just fascinated by them because I couldn't imagine why anybody would do it that way. But like I say, in, in, in the days when he was trying to get going, there were just wasn't a lot of stuff available, you know, and, and that's the way you had to do it. I mean, electromagnet's one way that a, a normal person can build a magnet. Right. And so that's, uh, so I would imagine that a lot of these were electromagnet speakers. Is there a reason we don't do that nowadays? Well, the reason we don't do it now is we, because uh, magnet materials come a long, long way. Uh, and, you know, uh, in, in his day, the first magnets were Alnico magnets and uh, as, as they find materials and mine materials and figure out better ways to do it, then at some point, the efficiency of doing it that way passed up the electromagnet. This microphone here, do you think that's one that Harry would have built most likely then? Probably, yeah, he, he probably built that. What? That's a carbon microphone. Um, carbon microphones are what um, uh, they used in telephones. So on a telephone, they, feed a voltage into it and carbon is a resist a normal resistance material and as you're talking to it the carbon granules would would move around and and then so the voltage coming out of it was um, modified by the carbon granules and that's what made the sound and so all a lot of the early microphones were carbons just like loudspeakers and newer microphones being dynamic um, um, they would have, you would, you would talk into it and move a diaphragm, which would move a coil inside of a magnet and produce foliage. But like I say, back in the early days, the, um, you know, 
magnets were not, were kind of at a premium, so carbon was the way to do that. There was another uh, microphone type out called a crystal microphone or a ceramic microphone where a voltage was produced uh, by a, a wire into a crystal. Um, but those, <clears throat> those never did go very far. Um, and we saw, you saw a lot of them on tape recorders and things of that nature back in, in those days, e you know, even in the 60s. Uh, I, I fixed a lot of equipment that used uh, crystal microphones, but uh, for broadcast, they, in the early, earliest days, they used carbon. Hmm. What would have the fidelity been like on a system like that? Pretty poor. Pretty poor? <laughs> yeah. Uh, everything was kind of geared around uh, telephone frequencies, which um, were uh, maybe 400 to 4,000 hertz, and uh, um, the carbon microphones weren't capable of much more than that. Um, this system likely had better fidelity than the microphone, you know, uh, better fidelity with the with the uh, record player than it did with the microphone because the record players could could go down lower. But I would say that system there probably didn't go below maybe 125 hertz uh, would, would be about as low as it would go. Hmm. Very neat, very neat. Thank you, thanks for the detailed explanations. Okay. Um, th this, is, this system here, I think he has it listed as our second sound system. Yeah, he kept he kept improving and kept building new things, and you know, it, uh, obviously the first system was a lot of stuff to carry around, a lot of stuff to set up, and, and in order to consolidate, he put it all in a trunk, and uh, and so this is uh, kind of a proud proud thing that he built. Um, he called it the Orthotrope, and uh, he he. Um, had the amplifiers built into it, the record players built onto it. The speakers are not in this picture, but he had a connection panel there for it. So that pile of stuff that you saw in the earlier picture was all consolidated into this one, just more advanced. Oh, okay. This this was all the head end, and and he'd still use the same speakers. Yeah, okay. yeah. Or he he had probably built newer More speakers ones by then. He. Um, <clears throat> That picture there shows the garage that where he built all of his gear. Oh, cool. Um, where would have that been located? I think it was up in East Mill Creek. Um, he had a the, he had a home up. Actually, it was across Wasatch, Wasatch Boulevard. You we kept going east as you started up Mill Creek Canyon. He had a home in that area, and uh, I think that's probably where it was. But I I don't know for sure. But, mm -hmm. uh, Harry was an interesting, um, interesting guy. I mean, the the bottom caption. Uh, this is a bad. Uh, <laughs> I should I should say poor picture of me, especially how sad I look. <laughs> and when if you knew him, that's exactly how he talked. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. On this. Uh Orthotrope. Uh, what's this um, this part of it right here with the three dots in it? You know, I I really don't know uh, what what that is. It's probably knobs. Oh, to gotcha. Be truthful. I never saw that piece. Uh, it was it was long gone before I started, and uh, the way I found out about it's looking at that picture right there. And gotcha. Um, a lot of these pictures didn't I didn't find them until after he had gone, and so or after at least the, after he had left the company. Tell us a little bit about this picture. Um, I don't know a lot, awful lot about what that picture was, but uh, by the vintage of the truck, uh, you know, it was uh, in the early 30s. And uh, of course, there was no other, no other people um, doing audio. And he got aligned with several Things like this one's the Salt Lake Theater Guild, and he was aligned with, uh, you know, the Utah State Fair and with KSL Broadcasting, and uh, and but this one was fairly early on because he still had the name Paul Audio Broadcasting, and I don't really know an awful lot about it. Um, the speakers 
uh, don't look like they use compression drivers, and so it was a it was a fairly early one. And huh. to, to put them up on a truck was just convenient way to get them in the air. And uh, he put them up there and tied them down, and so he could drive the truck to a spot and plug things in and start talking. Gotcha. This one come along, this was 1934, and by then compression drivers it out. So you see that big, uh, long six foot trumpet there um, that has a compression driver on the back of it. And uh, <clears throat> the other speakers are uh, use cone drivers. And since they, those would have been used more for low frequency. So to my knowledge, uh, I mean, there, there were other people doing two-way systems uh, with low frequencies, but to my knowledge, this is the first time he uh, actually got into doing high, separate high frequencies from low frequencies. Um, hmm. What would have a crossover system for that looked like, or would have it just been ran full range? They would have been run full range. He, would, he most likely would have put high-pass filters on the on the compression driver so they wouldn't burn out, but I'm pretty sure that the woofers were run full range. Yeah, this one also doing, um, using compression drivers. Um, in the early days, Harry was uh, aligned with a radio station called uh, KZN, and KZN later become KSL. Uh, KSL stands for K Salt Lake. And uh, early days, uh, KSL was used by a radio station in Alaska, but when they finally gave it up, then uh, our KSL here took it, and that was uh, back in uh, probably in the, in the late 20s or early 30s. And uh, so Harry was, was um, very much aligned with that, with that radio station. He did some broadcasting for them, um, and then he provided sound services for anything that they had. And of course they sponsored this. This was an early day rodeo that uh, he did. And uh, the KSL probably owned the truck, I don't know. But uh, um, hmm. that's one of, those, one of those interesting ones that came along. Gotcha. I see he has some spare horns there just in case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah some sitting under, yeah. Yeah, and I assume we don't know any of the people in the picture there, but no, I assume. I don't know any of them. The, he always, um, in the late 60s when I, when I started working there, we were always doing, he, he toured with several rodeo companies, and uh, I mean, rodeos were a big deal uh, back in those days. It was, uh, you know, hard to do sound reinforcement for a rodeo, and, uh, uh, you know, to get the height and everything. And when he would go out on a job, he would always take extra equipment. So I'm sure those horns were like, if he pulled out and needed to cover a bleacher that was in a different direction, he had them there just in case he had to do that. Gotcha. Do you think that system would have been fairly loud or? Not really um, because of the inefficiency of uh, compression drivers. Back then they were only 10 watt uh, devices. Uh, you know, things had grown by then. The amplifiers he used in that truck were probably only 20 watts or 25 watts. And uh, they wouldn't go loud in, in today's standards, but you have to remember that coming along in, in sound reinforcement, any sound reinforcement was better than nothing. Right. And, uh, and so uh, even though it didn't go really loud, it, it still was loud enough. Uh, you know, I'm sure there were people who thought it was too loud back in right, those days. Right, certainly. Getting yeah. complaints even back then. Yeah. What, what would have powered the system? Would have it been batteries in the truck? Would have there been AC power there? No, he, um, all of his sound trucks, he had ways to plug them in. And he also had ways to power them on batteries on the newer ones. The, the 1962 versions uh, <clears throat> had, uh, he, he did custom electronics uh, where he had it inverters that would supply the, the voltage to the tubes. And so he had ways of doing battery, but the power you got off battery was so dismal compared to plugging it in. And so um, the, he always tried to plug them in wherever he could. And I'm sure that one was plugged in. Gotcha. 
coming along just a little further back into 1940. That's Harry standing by his sound truck. And uh, at some point, he decided it was better to get the trucks high, or the speakers higher than just the top of the trucks. So he was innovative on creating these telescoping poles that could lift them up. Hmm. Interesting. What do you think it was like driving with all those horns on the truck? Do you think it? I guess they didn't drive very fast back then, but. Well, we didn't, and you know, and I, I can attest to it. I mean, it's like when I started working there, we had the Corvairs, and uh, I had to, you know, go all over the state, you know, to do uh, sound jobs, and they the wind drag on them was pretty good, but when you set them down, they folded up, you know, so he could fold them in so that they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't, you didn't have those horns facing forward, just collecting the wind that, like a wind scoop, he would turn them. Turn Did he ever share any stories of disasters where they went rolling down the road or? <laughs> oh, he, he shared stories of, uh, one day he was um, set up at the Salt Lake County Fair and, uh, uh, apparently a big wind gust had come up and anyway they he went back up to the truck after lunch or after the break and his poles were folded over <laughs> because the wind, wind had blown blown them uh, you know tipped them over so yeah he uh, I, I never heard of a, a disaster that he had with him or anything like that but uh, he was pretty careful. One thing about Harry, he was very, very meticulous and was very careful about what he did. He had good safety on everything. Everything was very safe. Um, hmm. Those pipes there, I'm not sure what they're made of. The, the ones on the 62 trucks were made of stainless steel. Oh, wow. And they were, they were very rigid, very hard, hard to bend. So 1940, this, the U.S. would have just about been entering World War II. Right. What, what effect did uh, the war play in Pulse Sound's history? Harry was born in 1911, so uh, for World War II, they were still drafting people his age, you know, so that would have put him in his 30s. Um, and uh, um, I think he told me one time that he, he got drafted, but that the, the radio station manager uh, of KSL knew knew the chairman of the draft board and so he the, he said no you can't have Harry I need him you know he's he's our chief engineer so besides doing the sound work he was he was engineer at the radio station and so <clears throat> uh, he told me that the the, the sound work kind of curtailed during the war he didn't do a lot of it because there just wasn't you know, people weren't in a celebrating mood. And so um, he, he just worked at the radio station during that time, but kept the, kept the equipment ready to go. In 1947, uh, 100 years after 1847, when the pioneers came from Winter Quarters, uh, Nebraska, out to Salt Lake City, uh, they re reenacted the trek, and Harry was invited to take his his uh, car out, uh, you know, his sound truck out, and follow the trek along to provide sound reinforcement for special meetings uh, that they would have. And they would stop at a place that had special significance, and then the announcer would announce what that was for because there were a, quite a number of people on the trek, and it would have been hard to talk to them without a sound system. Gotcha. That's Harry standing on the left there. I'm not sure who the other fellow is, but uh, uh, hmm. that was the truck that he took. And that was consequently the year that he changed the name <clears throat> of his company. So in, originally it was Paul Audio Broadcasting, and now it, this is Paul Sound Service. And I believe it was this job, that truck, that made him change the name and uh, paint it on the truck so that uh, he could take it out and get some advertising get some ad yeah get some advertising and you know just just that he's legitimately in the business of providing sound services yeah yeah certainly that was our first uh, retail store 1099 south state <clears throat> and uh the truck still says paul Aud uh, audio service on it but um uh he had 
he'd had a friend who did television. His name was Austin Mangelson, and so they renamed the company Paul and Austin, um, and uh, ran it that way for several years. And uh, Austin did the televisions, and uh, Harry did the the sound. And like I say, all simultaneously, all this time, they were also doing sound in homes, and uh, because it wasn't like it is today, where you have separate uh, commercial sound companies than, than home companies. Uh, when you were in the sound business back in those days, you were, you were doing it for everything. Yeah. And, uh, but that was our first taste into being associated with anything video was back in, the, in 1948 is when they did that. Uh, Paul and Austin lasted until 1955. Gotcha. So for a few years there. Huh. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what do you think it was like being an audio company in the 20s and 30s and 40s? Well, um, when, I, when I met Harry, he was kind of spoiled in the fact that he was always being complimented uh, on, on his sound, you know. It, uh, and, and for good reason. He, he, did, um, he did a very good job of, of making sure that the sound was clean and pure and as good a fidelity that is, could be accomplished, uh, you know, but a lot of it was the fact that, that he was just introducing the public to sound reinforcement, and some of them had never heard that, but all throughout his career, he just got complimented time and time again by entertainers, by, you know, uh, even President of the United States, and um, he just, uh, uh, and, and it kind of, he kind of lived on that. He kind of dwelled on it and kind of always trying to improve. And that was one of the attitudes about him is that he was always trying to do better and, uh, because he just loved those compliments that come in. But um, so, you know, I, I, you can imagine on his first days when he'd go out and set up and somebody had really never heard a sound reinforcement system again, how, you know, about how they would come up to him and just marvel at what he was doing. And so Certainly. Uh, I, I think a lot of it was that. I think uh, even if you did poor sound, you would, you would still be a, a unique feature back in those days. Yeah. But um, what, what challenges, uh, technological challenges were there in those times? Uh, was Harry a pioneer in anything? Well, he certainly was in <clears throat> terms of creating demand. Um, uh, those horns you see on that truck, uh, by, by the time, uh, I'm not sure which year they do it, but you, you remember the long horns on the earlier trucks, those were straight trumpets. These are reentrant trumpets here where they send the sound up through that tube in the middle and then it goes back, folds back and then goes uh, back again out to the outside. Um, it, it was people like Harry who created demand for speakers like this because the other ones were just too awkward. And him constantly talking to manufacturers about, uh, you know, this is what we need and uh, this is what we want. And in um, terms of absolute innovation, um, there are a couple of things that Harry was really, really good at. One of them was, was uh, uh, the fact that he was so meticulous. He was just an expert craftsman. Besides all of this that you see in going out and doing sound services, he was installing sound in churches and schools and uh, whatnot. And if you looked at any of the jobs that he did, he was just an absolute old fashioned old world craftsman. He just did it very, very good. And uh, another attribute that he had was the fact that it always had to be better. And uh, he wanted every job to be better. He wanted it to be, uh, you know, better than the first. And so his demand on equipment was, was uh, pretty striking, you know. And I, I think a lot of and being very early pioneer in it, uh, you know, the manufacturers were were wanting to give people what they wanted, and so uh, in terms of inventing things, probably not so much. But in terms of bringing the sound industry along, I think he was a huge player. Gotcha. Yeah, I can see, you know, that he was a perfectionist. Just even looking at the sound truck in this picture, 
you yeah. know now he's put the poles down through the through it yeah. through it you know and and uh, just always improving I could totally see that always improving always looking for better gear um, the other thing that he was very good at is uh, was being the uh, engineered sound uh, he would always uh, go into a room and uh, <clears throat> decide which product would work in best in that room and and then that's what he would either bring in on a rental or bring in a, on a installation um, just you know understanding the parameters of the room and bringing in the right gear uh, newer sound companies you know, you, you see a lot of them around, and what they are is a guy that's got a pair of speakers and he uses that same pair of speakers everywhere, you know. But Harry was never that way. It, he, he understood if you, had a, if you had a very live room, you had to use a specialized loudspeaker that could help overcome the reverberance of the room. Um, and uh, even if you had an auditorium that was fairly dead, you know, you had to use speakers that were, that were, um, proper to get the proper coverage and the proper throw and so he was he was champion and king of engineered sound systems and he passed that on the generations because I when I, I worked for him for eight years before he retired and uh, we you know that's that's what we did we 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 didn't just say I've got a speaker that's going to work anywhere and we went in and actually engineered for it and he taught me how to do that. Huh. Very cool. Yeah. This was uh, kind of funny. That's Harry's wife there. That's Maureen. And um, back in the 70s, uh, we used to do these home shows where the, the home and garden show used to also include a hi-fi section. And we, we would enter into that uh, hi-fi section of the home and garden show because we did also sell hi-fi. And um, there was a guy there. Uh, don't don't remember his name, but uh, he was from s south of uh, Salt Lake, and he he claimed that he had the oldest hi-fi shop in the state, you know. And uh, I put these pictures and uh, kind of brought them out to to show that you know no we we had been in hi-fi long before the guy was even born, and uh, uh, and so that's that's why these were there. But it also shows that. You know, the company was very diverse back then and, and did uh, quite a bit of home audio. Yeah, we see uh, home communication here. I, this being in the 50s, I assume that was pretty cutting edge back then. Yeah, yeah, that was early intercom. And I remember working on intercoms where you pull them out of the wall and they're full of tubes. And you know, Oh, really? Uh, in the yeah. wall? Tubes in the wall? Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> Transistors didn't come along until really in the late 60s. And so most of all of the stuff that I worked on, even, you know, it, in the mid-60s was all tubes. Everything was tubes. I assume around this time you started seeing lots of manufacturers versus, you know, people like Harry that are just home brewing things. You, you actually have finished products coming from manufacturers or, or is Harry still kind of Home no, no, these, these were manufactured products, you know, uh, a lot of, the, you know, like the horns uh, on the sound trucks and that, they, they were all manufactured. Um, the ones on uh, that sound truck was, they were made by University Sound, the Atlas Sound was making them by then. Uh, and this, I'm not sure, this is probably New Tone or, or one of the other home, home uh, intercom manufacturers. These are just more pictures of uh, doing sound in different areas. One on the left is just a rodeo. The one on the right is the Utah State Fair. And uh, Harry had an association with the Utah State Fair clear back in the, I think the late 20s. Um, and uh, we'd done the job there every, ever since, except for one year we lost it to, to a competitor and he couldn't take the pressure. and. Uh, uh, f faltered on the job after three days, and then Harry went back and finished the fair out. Oh, you know? wow. So. Ah, very interesting. That's, 
I assume at the fair you'd have multiple sound trucks for the various things, or you'd drive them around as you know, yeah. to the rodeo or to the... Early on, they were even used on stages, uh, you know, because uh, they had the woofers uh, with them. So they were used for stages, for parades, um, for just general announcements. He would use sound trucks. They were a lot easier to set up than climbing poles and putting on horns, but uh, it was a lot different then than it is nowadays. Certainly. Yeah, just more of these. Yeah, so, so this horn here on these trucks at the bottom, this is a... That's a WLC, and uh, <clears throat> it's kind of what differentiated Harry from other people. Um, again, he's always trying to get the better quality, and so he, he felt like he needed to add some low end. So he added that, that WLC, and it really enriched the sound, made it much more full range sound. And, the other horns are long throw trumpets, and uh, and in in '57 the, the the store on State Street had been opened. Would have this been at that 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 location, or would have this been at Harry's house, or? Well, this was at his house. By this time, after Austin Mangelson left, um, they split up. Uh, Harry changed the name of his company to Custom Sound by Paul. Uh, this is 1957. It's an ad so. from. Uh, it was in the fair flyer. I think it was a fair program or something yeah. that uh, Judy Duncombe sent over to us a few years ago. Yeah. Um, it looks like we were doing radio and phono repair. All throughout the history of Paul Sound from day one, it's always involved repair uh, because, or the custom electronic shop because Harry would build his own gear, and then as people would buy their gear and need it repaired, he would, he would repair it. And <clears throat> back in those early days, uh, you know, uh, even, even up into the 60s, uh, there was quite a bit of uh, repair work coming in. In fact, in the 60s, it kind of exploded because everybody was buying sound systems for their homes. Looks like at this time in, in 57, he's moved, you know, his address is a little different there on the ad. Yeah, okay, so 1651 South 11th East, uh, the company was there for quite some time. I'm not sure when it moved there, but that's where it was when I started there in the mid 60s. Gotcha. And, uh, um, and the, the, it was right across the street from Salt Lake Costume Shop up on the, on the east side, it was, um, it was a pretty good lo location, you know, and a lot of people uh, understood that's what Paul Sand was and where it was. And, uh, you know, a lot of them associated the company a lot of years with that being in that location. Yeah, and I, I know I don't have um, any pictures of it, but I, I'm just going to touch on it because I know it was part of our history. Um, it, at some point there, it was, we did organs. The Paul family... Um, very interesting family. Uh, Harry, Harry was interested in the sound, you know, and he focused on the sound, but Maureen was a really good, uh, that's his wife, she was a very good organ player, and uh, um, as opportunities would come along, uh, like franchises come along, the Con Organ franchise was, was one that um, she, she was very interested in that, and since Harry had already had a retail outlet, she would try to introduce uh, organs and music in, into that, you know, so that it was not only a sound shop, but it was also an organ shop. And uh, that, that went on right up until 74 when they, when they sold the business to my family. Uh, they, they had organs associated with it. And so, um, interesting two of uh, Harry's sons, Harry had 10 children, and uh, two of his sons went into the organ business. Uh, they stayed in the pipe organ business, which is uh, pipe organs that are, of course, you know, uh, you're physically blowing into a pipe and uh, creating the sound that electronic organs created internally. But um, they went into the pipe organ business, which is um, kind of a, a a, a difficult business in a lot of ways because you have to be able to manipulate these pipes and build them in and things and it takes a long time to build a pipe organ. The uh, 
pipe organ in the in the conference center started in 2000 it wasn't finished until 2004 or 5 mm -hmm. uh, you know i mean it just takes takes a long time because there's many many ranks of pipes uh, but so it's, it seems like the family all polarized some of them like sound and some of them like organ and uh, uh, but that's just what they did but that's how that all came about interesting yeah i, I uh, the church i go to there's a pipe organ in there that the paul family had installed and yeah i know robert paul who is one of harry's sons he still comes and Right. services that organ in our church once in a while so it's R robert paul is the last one uh, he was the youngest of the kids and he he still is in pipe organs he's the chief organ technician for the salt lake tabernacle and the conference center and he uh, also takes on those smaller jobs you know going around to wards and and uh, bound around to buildings and servicing them yeah That's very cool uh, so Pipe organs, uh, organs of any style, were were a big part of the family. Even though Harry never paid much attention to it, Harry was always just sound. He's just a sound guy. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, this is just more pictures. That that, that was the 1961. That's uh, they he was using Chevrolet trucks at that point. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. got the 59 Elko County Fair, I think. Yeah, yeah. Looks like he's got some different horns on that than usual on both of those, honestly. <clears throat> um, it looks like more like an Atlas CJ46 or something. 45s, actually. Oh, 45, okay. Yeah, the 45 had the screw-on driver, and the 46 had the driver built it in. Oh, uh, okay. Built into it, and uh, they were... He's always looking for ways to improve, and uh, that's a smaller horn that sounded, you know, fairly good. It didn't didn't go as low as the bigger horns did, but had a lot lower profile and was, you know, able to carry a number of them around um, a lot easier and a lot easier to deal with. But uh, hmm. up until the last days, he still kept with, you know, the round trumpets for the most part, but we had... Uh, a lot of those flatter CJ45s in our in our uh, rental inventory. Hmm. And uh, the the days of 47 parade. How how has Harry been involved with that parade over the years? Uh, what, what was his involvement there? Probably from the beginning. I, d I don't know exactly when he started with it, but it's been one of the jobs that's just come along. Uh, uh, every single year, we've we've had sound systems working that parade. Got some more pictures here. Yeah, those the Corvairs came along in 1962, and he bought two identical ones. And, uh, and they, when I, they, those were still in operation when I started working there, and they were marked one and two. And he always drove uh, Corvair number one. You know, that was. I asked him one time, why did you, what, what made you number them one and two, you know, what made you decide which one to number one and two? And he says, well, number one came first. <laughs> <laughs> so those pictures were um, uh, the announcers, Frank Nebaker, who announced the Days of 47 Parade. He's standing on top of the truck. Um, he was an announcer for the Days of 47 Parade for uh, at least 20 years, uh, maybe even longer. And so, picture on the left is uh, all the days of 47 parade when the when the Brigham Young Monument used to be out in the middle of the street. Picture on the right was the dedication of the Eagle Gate, um, and uh, Eagle Gate I think still stands up there. It's on State Street I think in South Temple. Yeah, we we park the the box truck underneath of the Eagle Gate every year for the parade. Yeah. Even now we we usually park right underneath that. It's kind of the start of the parade right there. Yeah. 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 So uh, that was when it was dedicated. Huh, very cool. Some clever photographer just took a <laughs> good yeah. picture of it. Yeah, he certainly did. Did you have to reinforce the inside of those vans to have a, an announcer standing on top of them? Or? <clears throat> the platform weight is distributed all around. The, the, the platform's a flat board, but the little rise on it was custom made to, to put 
weighed equally all the way around the van. You could stand two or three people up there plus all the equipment. And, and, and I assume the sound operator sits inside the van and... That's where the equipment was, yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, I, I know, you know some of the days were just really long. Uh, I, I remember Harry uh, sitting in the van after a long day, you know, and he's, he's just kind of watching the controls, whether it be for a rodeo or a show or whatever, and he'd put his back on those warm amplifiers and put him right to sleep, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, he, uh, he, 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 had, he had really good endurance, but, you know, it, yeah. everybody has their limit. <laughs> oh, certainly, and you probably didn't have air conditioning in those vans. And, no, and they hot and, no. Yeah. In fact, they were, they were air-cooled engines, and uh, I remember driving one over to Fort Duchesne, and as I was going up uh, Parley's Canyon and Daniel's, um, you know, the engine overheating, had to stop for a bit to get it to cool down. Oh, so. wow. Yeah. Ah. Uh, I think this is just another one of the, the hi-fi boots. Yeah, the hi-fi. Oh. Yeah, that's what that was. Yeah. It looks like, uh, I don't know, there's some manufacturers there. ULTV University, I guess that's University Sound now. Yeah, University Sound, That you know, they were later swallowed up by a big conglomerate. They were part of the Electro Voice thing, and uh, now they're just... I, I don't think they exist anymore. Right, Dynaco, what was Dynaco? I Dynaco, uh, they built a lot of kits, and uh, so did Ico. Uh, Ico there on the ground. Uh, back in those days, it was very popular for you to, if you want to buy an AM, FM receiver or an amplifier, you bought a kit and put it together. Gotcha. That's what that was. Um, you yeah. see, you see Crown there. We were involved with Crown uh, almost from the day they opened. Uh, um, we also did a lot of uh, work at radio stations and Crown. In the early days, all they built were tape decks, and so we we would outfit radio stations with uh, with tape decks. And um, later on, Crown got into audio amplifiers and the first transistor amplifiers and. Uh, um, they were, you know, that, that's where basically where Crown came from. Gotcha. And, and what uh, about United Audio Dual there? Dual is, it was a turntable manufacturer, and uh, um, I, I, they still have a reputation to this day, you know, of, of how good they were. Hmm. Um, Electro Voice, of course. Scott was a receiver manufacturer. What 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 was a is it Gerard there? Gerard is a was a turntable manufacturer as well. And then you got Sherwood. Sherwood there. is also AM FM receivers and amplifiers. Uh, Benjamin Dynacord was um, tape decks. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so tape was kind of coming around. Or yeah. Around, would it have been like an eight track or a four track or? Typically four track, sometimes two track. Yeah, and then over on the right, I think there's Acoustatone. Acoust well, everybody knows why Ampex is, uh, <clears throat> was uh, tape decks as well. Acoustone was grill cloth uh, in those early days uh, with, with people building things on their own. A lot of people built their own loudspeakers, and okay. Paul Sound was known as a place you could come and get any kind of grill cloth you wanted. Oh, cool. And we sold, uh, we sold a lot of it, not only for that, but also for... Um, going into the front of churches, you know, in front of the organ grill hmm. and so on. What was uh, Empire? Uh, Empire was a speaker manufacturer and uh, I don't remember a lot about them. I think the speakers in the corner there were Electro Voice. Oh. Uh, Empire, what I remember about them is that they built these round speakers that, and the woofer face down and then the, the um, high frequencies faced out. Hmm. Um, we sold quite a number of empires in the, even after I got there. But gotcha. And Frazier, I think. Frazier, Frazier, uh, interesting company from Texas. Um, they used to build commercial loudspeakers, but they built hi-fi loudspeakers. And uh, most through most of our hi-fi days, Frazier was our top line of loudspeakers. And uh, they, 
they, they went a long way. They, they had a model Fraser 11 at one point that was a, looked like a refrigerator. It was so big, but boy, it could ever put out the sound. You know, oh, really? At the base, you know. Huh. And the chief competition at that point was Klipsch. Uh, they had their Klipsch horn, and so Klipsch and Fraser were kind of chasing each other's tail, but uh, we, we elected to stay with the, the Fraser. With Fraser, gotcha. And then uh, late, in later years, uh, we, we used a lot of Fraser um, for their commercial. Gotcha. What, um, I don't know if you know what any of these banners were advertisements of. Uh, I, I can't really. I don't there. know for sure. Uh, that was before my time. Yeah, that's, that's really. By a few years. <laughs> by a few years? Just a couple of years. <laughs> gotcha. Ah, very cool. Thank you. Um, Let's see, I think I've got this one here. That's Elko County Fair. That was another job that, uh, um, you know, we were the first comp sound company they ever used and continued on for many years. And I don't know whatever happened to it. At some point, it just went away, probably in the, in the early 70s. We, we, they stopped calling us to do jobs for them, but. Mm. Yeah, Elko, that's a ways away from Salt Lake. That would have been a drive back in the Yeah, day. yeah, it was. But huh. um, there, there's not a lot of this listed, but in, in Harry's day, is, is, is the day, it was the time that we started into big full-range loudspeakers for concert work. Um, I mean, <clears throat> he, used, he used this type of equipment uh, in the 50s, you know, for singers like Bing Crosby and entertainers like Bob Hope and uh, and that but as you know in the in the 60s when the rock and roll rage started it was pretty evident that he had to do something to improve the the quality and you know the fullness of because they were demanding a lot of bass out of the systems and so in in the later years starting probably in about 68 is when we started buying full range loudspeakers to deal with concerts and uh, most of that was all tech gear and uh, some of it was university gear but uh, which we ran and then since that industry has come so rapidly in you know we, we've just had to stay up with it and and uh, i think in our next segment we'll start talk about some of the stuff that we built to do that yeah certainly we certainly yeah. will um, in 2024, we'll celebrate uh, our hundredth anniversary, That's right. um, which is very rare. Uh, so just some light research: um, only half a percent of companies that get started make it to that milestone. Mm -hmm. um, a study in 2011 determined that there was roughly 540, 540 companies that were still in business, which is pretty small. Yeah, and. Uh, just some notable companies that started around the same time as we did was uh, Biodynamic mm -hmm. and uh, Duracell. Mm -hmm. I don't imagine that Biodynamic was making microphones. I think they were more of a uh, telecoms and, and yeah. radios. But yeah. uh, well, all of the early stuff was that way. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's quite an accomplishment. I think you know that. Um, I, I started to work for the company, and it's in. 66 so it was 42 years old when I started to work there and uh, you know uh, I know that yeah you know, looked at some of these pictures I know that Harry underwent a lot of changes a lot of changes made in that first period of time but now I look back over the last 42 years and uh, I'm thinking there's more changes in the last one you know it's just one of those yeah. things where just change keeps coming along and yeah it certainly does yeah. When was Harry's last year at Pole? Um, <clears throat> we bought the company in 1974, but he was on contract to work for us for three years, you know, to kind of deliver the customers over to us. And so his last year there was uh, 1977. 1977. Uh -huh. And then he, uh, he, he retired, and I saw him quite often. Uh, he couldn't stop building sound equipment. The guy, the guy just had it perpetually in him, and so even after he sold the company, he had to build himself a sound system, a, a sound truck, and he built it uh, mostly to do 
he, uh, Harry was president of the Sons of the Utah Pioneers for a period of time, and he just, he, that's all he ever used it for was the SUP, Sons of Utah Pioneer celebrations. And, um, but uh, so from, uh, you know, after he left in 77 for about 10 years, he, he, he built him a system and was using it all the time. He'd come in and see me all the time. He would, um, you know, bought a number of things from us. And uh, he was very much into equalization, you know, and we, we sold these URAI equalizers and he came in and bought those and um, built him up this little system. But he was perpetual, even in his, even in his older age, he couldn't stop building sound systems. So. Wow. Uh. He died in 1989. He had some kind of illness, and I never really did find out what that was, but uh, he was only 77 when he passed away, and <clears throat> his his wife uh, outlasted him by another 20 years or more. Oh, wow. Healthy then. Uh, she was. Uh, you know, the, the whole family was, but um, I don't know what, what it was that took Harry, but um, it, it was kind of a sad day in my life, uh, you know, because he was... Uh, he was a great teacher. He just, he instinctively knew how to uh, do sound in these places. And I was just, I was just mesmerized by his speaking and, and uh, just overcome almost every time by the no amount of knowledge that he had on how to do sound in different areas. Um, go into different rooms and he knew exactly what to do. You know, he just very, very experienced with it. So he gave he gave me a, a real leg up on on a lot of other people who come into the sound business because uh, of the experience that he had and uh, uh, the information that he passed on. Wow. Do you, do you think he was pretty proud of his legacy? I think he was. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I say, he was. Uh, he had received so many compliments over his life, and I think he was very proud of that. And uh, hmm. uh, do you think he, if he saw the company now, what what do you think he would think about it? How would he feel? Well, I think he would be happy that it's still operating. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know that he thought it was going to go very far. I mean, yeah. honestly, then I <clears throat> he when it, when he sold it to us, he he sort of said, well. You know, I, I, I put my time into it, and now it's up to fate what happens to it. And uh, I don't know that he knew, but we, we bought it on a 15-year contract, so I, I think he had pretty good faith that it was going to last at least 15 years. You know, yeah. I, I think he would be really proud. I think he would be awestruck if he saw this building here. I think he, would, he would, wouldn't believe what he was seeing wow. if, if he could see it today, you know. Wow. Do you have any just hairy stories, stories that he told you over the years, funny stories, sad stories? I don't know. Well, there are, there are a lot of them uh, that, that, you know, happened when I was working with him. Uh, <clears throat> we were, one of them was we were in a, in a church and uh, Harry was, he, he wouldn't give up, you know. I mean, it started at eight o'clock in the morning and, uh, you just work until you fell over, you know. And uh, so we were working in this church, putting the new sound system in it. And uh, um, we had a scaffold set up that went up to the center cluster in, in, in the church. And we were building this center cluster. And um, it was late at night, probably about 9 o'clock at night. And he sent me up. He says, go up and take this, this uh, bucket of black paint and a brush and go up there and paint the entire inside of a black. I don't want to see any white or any light color inside there. And so I did. I climbed the scaffold and painted it. And just after I started to paint, he he disappeared. I don't, didn't know where he went, you know, but uh, I just kept painting along. It took me about an hour to to paint the inside of that cabinet. and. Then I kind of cleaned up the brush and went down. I still no Harry. I don't know where he was. And uh, uh, I walked around and uh, went into the restroom, and there was Harry um, cleaning the restroom. 
And I says, what, what are you doing? And he said, well, it was dirty when I came in and I just can't just stand to see a messy place. <laughs> so so he, he was, spent the whole hour in there cleaning that restroom that he, uh, and you know, well, left me out there working. But he, you know, it was just kind of, kind of the way he was. He, he, he couldn't stand to see anything but perfection. And, uh, um, he was he was a lot of fun to be around, but many many like that. I he he told me lots of stories about. Um, um, for instance, there was a a guy that worked for him um, that was working out at the state fair, and of course, back in the early days, you were not only the sound system operator, but you were also the announcer. Oh, really? You know, they they would never have a separate announcer. It was always because Harry came from a, a position where he was a radio announcer, and uh, uh, so to him it was usual. You know, uh, but to other people that worked for him, it was not so much. And uh, he <clears throat> he had put, told this other guy to you know sit there and make announcements, uh, and the other guy was just really, really nervous about doing it, you know, and uh, practically to the point where he stumbled over his words and everything, and um, somebody brought him an announcement uh, uh, to have the fair director uh, report to the, to the horticulture building. And, uh, and so he, he, got, he was just really nervous, and he started to talk, and he says, uh, fair director, please report to the horror building. And Harry said, I sent him home and told him not to come back. <laughs> so, just oh, that's funny. funny stories. But Harry used to tell me stories of, uh, you know, the entertainers that he would deal with. Um, uh, you know, very, very prevalent back in, the, in there. And, but most of them, most of the stories were you know, centered around how they how they li they liked the sound and how they couldn't get over how good it was, and uh, so. Um, but interesting, interesting character. Huh. It, his family were interesting too. They one time they invited me to uh, go up to a social that was just Harry and Maureen and his ten kids and their their siblings or, or their wives, the spouses. Um, and it was the most interesting place I'd been because he'd go up and you'd go, you'd go stand and listen to one of the one of the siblings, and he'd be talking about one thing, and then the the guy who was talking about uh, would would talk about it an entirely different subject, and so and then and then when it was this guy's turn to talk, he would talk about the subject he was, and this guy, it was like they weren't even <laughs> listening to each other. Oh man! <laughs> but uh, uh, but Harry was proud of him. He's proud of his ten kids. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Well, we uh, we hope you've all enjoyed watching this uh, video. Um, please subscribe if you haven't already. Um, please leave us your question comments below. If there's anything you'd like to know about Harry or Deward, please be sure to let us know, and we'll be sure to answer those uh, questions in future episodes. Um, we're planning to release many more videos and we're excited about this series. Thanks, Stuart. You bet. Thank you. <laughs>